Well, good morning, Red Hills Church. How are you doing this morning? Good. So good to see you. Welcome to our church. My name is Aaron Hansen. I'm the lead pastor at our church. If you're new here at our church, I love to say this, that it's okay to not be okay. And my genuine prayer for you is this, that you can come as you are, but my hope and my prayer is that when you leave, you are changed by the grace of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen to that? That is my prayer for your life. I am glad that you're here this morning. You came on a good Sunday. You came on a great Sunday because we're starting a new series called Eternity, called Eternity Is Now, and I'm glad to be starting this this morning. I want to tell you about one of my favorite places in Oregon, and uh, my family's favorite place in Oregon is in Sun River, Oregon. How many of you have been to Sun River? Now, it, it is like, for my family, Family. I've got six, uh, four kids, not six kids, <laughs> unless you, told, you have something that you haven't told me about. I hope, I hope not right now. Uh, there's six of us in our family, four kids, and, and we all love it, and we go there every year. It is part of the Hanson family tradition to go to Sun River for a week. It is the one place that we all go to that we absolutely love. Now, if you have multiple kids, you realize that is a miracle in and of itself because we can't go to a restaurant without somebody complaining and somebody wanting something else. And so all my kids love it and my family loves it. It's the one place that we can decompress and just enjoy God's nature and creation uh, and it's wonderful. And this last summer, we were able to go in July for an entire week in Sun River. And uh, for us, Sun River is a four-hour drive uh, for a normal family or a normal individual. But for us... It's a six hour drive because my kids, for some reason, my kids cannot plan their potty breaks at the same time. And so I've got a four year old and an eight year old that are kind of squirrely and squirmy and and it seems about every 15 or 20 minutes, someone's gotta go to the bathroom. And so it takes us a lot longer to get places than it actually should. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And so it's a six hour drive. And, and so we, we pull out on a Sunday afternoon. We plan our vacations right after church. And so we get home, the car's already packed and we pull out. We're about 20 minutes down the road. And, and my daughter from the very, very back row, the third row, uh, she shouts out, hey dad. And she asks the question that all kids ask when you go on a road trip. What is the question? Are we there yet? I said, honey, I said, we've got a long way to go. Look, it's a four hour drive, but it's probably gonna take us about six hours to get there. So you have about five hours and 40 minutes left of the trip. And so we're driving down and we finally get on the freeway. We get on the five and we're headed towards Salem to before we cross over, over the mountain. And, and my daughter pipes up again, but this time she's a little smarter. And she said this, dad, she goes, are we halfway there yet? I said, no, honey, we've got a long way to go. We have five hours to go. And the whole trip, my daughter and my son and my kids, they asked me, are we there yet? Why? Because they have a desire in their heart to be somewhere else than they are right now. Listen, here's where I want to start today. I believe that every single one of us here has a desire in our heart to be somewhere better than we are right now. You see, kids express in the physical what we experience in the spiritual and emotional, that there is a better place, that there is a future set out for us that is better than the here and now and the present that we currently have. Now, in our church, as a follower of Jesus, we believe that desire is the desire for eternity. The desire for eternity, and the title of the series is Eternity is Now. Eternity Now, and eternity means what? Someone just shout out. What does eternity mean? Forever. Look at someone next to you say, that's a really long time. Forever. And so we were created with a sense of, of eternity and we have this longing in our heart for eternity. And and here's what's interesting is that since the beginning of time, every culture, every civilization, uh, everyone who's ever lived has had this sense that there is something better or beyond this life. 
And and, and this idea has captured the hearts and imaginations of every culture. The idea that we will live forever and experience eternity has shaped every civilization in human history. Let me read some of them for you. The, The Australian Aborigines pictured heaven, eternity, as a distant island beyond the western horizon. The early Finns thought it was an island in the faraway east. The Mexicans, Peruvians, and Polynesians believed that they went to the sun or the moon after they died. Native Americans Americans believed then that, that in the afterlife that their spirits would hunt the spirits of the buffalo. There's this ancient Babylonian legend called the Gilgamesh Epic, and in it, it refers to a resting place of heroes, and it even hints at a tree of life. In the pyramids of Egypt, the embalmed bodies are buried with a map for the underworld or the future world or the next world. The Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in the Elysian fields and their horses would graze nearby. In fact, Seneca, a Roman philosopher, said this, says, the day thou fearest as the last is the birthday of eternity. And although all these depictions of the afterlife differ, the unifying testimony of mankind since the beginning has been that there is something better or more than we have right now. Now, an anthropologist and sociologist has confirmed this, that in every culture, in every civilization, in every race, in every part of the world, people have a sense that there is more. Now, here's what I want to tell you, that the Bible tells us that there is more. In fact, the Bible confirms and affirms what every human has ever experienced. And, and this, is, this is where I want to start, Ecclesiastes 3.11. This is going to be a theme verse for the next six weeks. We'll get it up on the screen. And it is as Solomon, the son of David, wrote this. He said, God has set eternity in the human heart. This was written a thousand years, a thousand, 1,000 BC, this was written. 3,000 years ago from today, this was written, that God has set eternity in the human heart. Now I want to get familiar with this passage. So I'm going to ask everyone in the room to repeat this after me. On the count of three, let's say this together. One, two, three. God has set eternity in the human heart. And what Solomon is saying is that God has placed inside every man, woman, and child, every being who's ever lived on this earth with a sense that there is something more. And we call it eternity, eternity, this idea that there is forever, that there is something more, that there is something beyond. And he, here's what I found interesting. I've been, I've been planning and praying for this series because we're doing it along with our small groups here at our church for about five months. And as I've been studying this, I found something so fascinating. I'm going to share a little bit more about this next week when I talk about heaven. But, 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 but this week, I, I found something fascinating. And, and I was reading what uh, scientists and atheists who claim that there is no God, what they believe about the afterlife. In, in many atheists uh, would believe that... Th- in an afterlife, even though they believe that there is no God. And in fact, there's an encyclopedia, it's called the New Encyclopedia of Unbelief. It is like the atheist Bible and the editor of it, a prominent atheist, he says this, listen, he says, it is reasonable for an atheist to believe, all right, I love the language, believe in in a personal supernatural afterlife As long as, here's the caveat, as long as they believe that it's not presided over by a personal God. Listen, I don't even have to do my homework to convince you that even atheist scientists who deny the existence of God have a belief in their heart and a sense that there is something more. Why? Because God has put in every heart what we call eternity. He has set eternity and placed it in your heart. And what that means is this. It means that you were wired with the sense of eternity and and your soul will not rest until you are reconnected with the eternity that God created for you. In fact, if you're here today and and you're feeling uh, discontent with your life, 
or, or maybe you're here and you're, you're, feeling, um, you're feeling restless. And some of you, you know what I'm talking about. You feel like, like maybe there's something more or maybe you're not living the life that, that you should be living. And maybe you think it's a career. Maybe you think it's, a, 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 it's moving somewhere. Maybe you think it's more education and you just can't put your finger on it. But there's a general discontentment. Or maybe some of you, it's, it's an emptiness that, 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 that overwhelms you or a sadness and you ever wake up and you're sad and you realize that there's no reason for me to be sad but 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 listen oftentimes that discontent that restlessness is your soul wanting to be reconnected with its purpose what God calls eternity and you will go find whatever you can find to fill the, 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 the emptiness in your heart because the culture offers us a way to fill that eternity. But I'm gonna tell you that it's always gonna come up short and it's always not gonna be enough because God wired you with eternity and he wired you for you to be connected with the eternal God. This, this is what I wanna talk about for the next six weeks. This series has taken six weeks. So you'd think it'd be an eternity, but it's only six weeks. So I want you to hang with me for six weeks. But here's what we're gonna do. I want you to imagine you're in an airplane right now and the cruising altitude is 36,000 feet. And you look out the window and you see the landscape and the geography of, of, of wherever you're flying over. Today, I want to fly at 36,000 feet at cruising altitude. And I want to give you a picture of what the Bible says about eternity. I want to define eternity for you according to the scripture. But I want to get a big picture view of what the Bible says about eternity eternity. And throughout the next six weeks, we're going to descend lower and lower and lower until we land the plane on the ground and we get a close-up picture of what it means to live with the reality that I'm going to teach today. And so today is going to be a little more theological, a, a little more intellectual to understand God's plan and God's purpose for eternity. But hang with me for six weeks because we are gonna talk on a practical level of what it means for us to live out our lives and the reality that we learn today. And so this is where I wanna start. I wanna start with the Bible. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter two. Now, Here's the thing, if, if, if you're new to our church, if you've been here for a while, you know that just about every series I start, I start with the book of Genesis. I do that because it's where God starts and, and just about everything that we deal with in our life and everything that we teach can be found in the first few chapters of Genesis. So when we talk about relationships, we start in Genesis. When we talk about career or vocation, it's actually there in Genesis. When we talk about purpose and destiny, it's actually there in Genesis. And so I want to start in the book of Genesis. If you're new to the Bible, let me give you a tip. If you're new to the Bible and you want to know what, what the story of God is, read the first book and the last book. All right, read the first book, Genesis, and the last book, Revelation. In fact, if you say, Aaron, that takes too long, let me just say this. Read the first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, and you will get the story and the plan of God. Are you with me? I love to say this. If you took sin out of the Bible, what would you have? A pamphlet, right? You'd have four pages of the Bible, and read those four pages, and you'll know what God's plan actually is. And so I want to start with the book of Genesis. And in the story of Genesis is the origin of the world, of, of everything we see that is created. And Genesis 1 starts out with God's spirit hovering over the waters and he begins to create each day and he begins to create uh, the, the, the earth and the water and the, and the trees and the landscape and the animals and then he creates uh, Adam and Eve. And, 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 and chapter two of Genesis is like this zooming in of the Garden of Eden that God creates this, this paradise for Adam and Eve to live in. And, and most of you, you know the story. And, and, and in paradise and in Eden, I mean, it is the most glorious place that you could ever 
imagine. And, and what God did is he put, he put all kinds of trees in the garden so that Adam and Eve could be a self-sufficient within this garden of Eden. And, but, but he put two trees in the very center of the garden. And, and in Genesis 2.9, if you have your Bibles, you can read it uh, there or follow along with me. Uh, in Genesis 2.9, it says this, that the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden, were the tree of life, this is important, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the tree of life brought what? Life. The tree of life is where Adam and Eve could go to satisfy the longing in their hearts for eternity. And so they could pick the fruit of the tree of life at any time and experience the fullness of life. But, but then he said, there's another tree. And the other tree is the knowledge of good and evil. And, and God says this to Adam and Eve. He says, you can eat of any tree in the garden, any tree, have fun. But there's one tree you can't eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, if you, if you eat of this tree, that there's gonna be a consequence. There's gonna be a consequence if you eat of this tree and Adam and Eve do what it seems like humans do. They disobey God and do the one thing that they're not supposed to do. Now let me talk about my kids for a moment. Uh, I, I've got four kids, I told you that. Three boys and a girl, and it, and it seems. My kids are really curious, they're full of life. They, they, they love having fun, but it seems to me that, that my kids always wanna do the one thing they're told not to do. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? They're a lot like their mother. And they always wanna do the things that I tell them not to do. Well, a few months ago, my daughter had a major accomplishment in her life and I said, hey honey, I'll, I'll take you out somewhere and uh, we'll, we'll go to uh, like a, a place and have fun. And she goes, dad, what I really want uh, for this is I want a hamster. I said, okay, let's look at having a hamster. We've had a hamster before. They're pretty reasonable to take care of. We don't have a lot of pets, but we can do a hamster. And uh, so we go buy a hamster and uh, she buys this cute little hamster and she names the hamster Mimi. This is, this is her name. And, uh, it, it, and I have a four-year-old son that, that loves Mimi. And uh, Bennett, uh, we, we've caught him so many times getting out his stool and Mimi, is, her cage is in Sophia's room. It's on her dresser. And then you've got this glass cage and the lid on top. And he would come over and bring his stool into her room, step on the stool, lift off the cage. And this is what he would do with this hamster because he didn't want to pick her up. He'd grab her by the scruff of her neck. And, and, and uh, you can do this with hamsters, I guess. And he'd get down and play with her. Now, now, if you've ever heard the expression that cats have nine lives, I'm convinced hamsters have 21 lives uh, because there's no way this hamster should be alive. I can't tell you the whole story. You can ask me later, but, but I'm not kidding you. I found Mimi in one of our gutters that I had to get a ladder out to get her out of the gutters and she was completely okay, all right? My, my, yes, my son slid open the screen and let Mimi out the window and she fell into the gutter. And so we say, Bennett, you can't play with the hamster by yourself. You have got to ask permission. And so on Friday, this just happened two days ago, on Friday, uh, uh, Bennett uh, comes downstairs and, and you can always know uh, when your kids do something wrong by the expression on, your fi on their face. How many of you know? You, you, kids, you, you think your parents just are, are, uh, know what you're thinking. It's because of the expression on your face. That's how we know. And he comes downstairs, even a four-year-old, and he comes downstairs, and I'm not home at the time, but my wife and uh, my mom's in town, and, and he, goes, uh, he goes, I lost Mimi. And uh, so we said, what do you mean you lost Mimi? He said, I, I lost Mimi, and you're trying to decipher what lost Mimi actually means. And so they go upstairs and they search for Mimi. And, and he said this, he said, I decided to give Mimi a bath. <laughs> you don't give hamsters baths. And he said, I decided to give Mimi a bath in the toilet. <laughs> you know, because the logical place is the toilet, not the sink or the bathtub. And so he gives Mimi a bath in the toilet and he says he got her out like this, and he dried her off, and then he got distracted, and then he left and he went to play in his room. And so we're all thinking the worst happened 
to this hamster. And there's some major grief in my household. I mean, my daughter is in tears and she's crying and we searched high and low for this hamster. We looked under every bed, we lifted every shirt on the ground, the, the hampers, I mean, everything and we could not find the hamster. And, and my son, who has a real sensitive spirit, I, I would think that he hears from the Lord and he comes home and he goes, Dad, he goes, I, I, I just don't think Mimi's gonna make it. And so we, you know, we had this somber moment in our family that Mimi is gone, right? And, and, and all of us, we don't want to say it, but we think she made it down the toilet. And, and so, you know, we have this sad day. I put my daughter to bed, and there's lots of tears. And then, uh, and then, and then I decide to, to go to bed early. And, um, and so we put all the kids to bed. My wife's out of, t uh, uh, out, out of the house. She's at a meeting. And, and I retire early, and I, I slip into my bed. You know where this is going. <laughs> I slip into my bed and I fall asleep and all of a sudden I feel something, something on my leg, like warm and fuzzy and I, I think my wife's being cute and, and playing footsie with me and, and, I, and I reach over and I realize that she's not on the pillow and I throw the blankets off, I scream at the top of my lungs because at 10 o'clock at night a hamster is not a hamster, it's a rat with no tail and I throw it off, I turn on the lights and there is Mimi snuggling with my leg all in her mess. Boy, did Bennett get in trouble that day. <laughs> and it seems that our kids are just like us. They do the one thing that you ask them not to do. And Adam and Eve did that. They take a bite of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says this, because you did that, Genesis 3.22, the Lord God said that the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. What God did is he said the consequence for eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the one thing I told you not to do is you can no longer eat of the tree of life that brought you eternity, that reconnected the sense in your heart when your purpose in your heart with my destiny for your life. And so since then, when you read in the scripture, what you see is man and woman's search for eternity. And you see it all throughout the scripture and you read it over and over. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he offers humanity the one thing that they've been missing, a chance to eat of the tree of life again in Revelation 2, 7, the very last book of the Bible says this, whoever has ears, let them hear. Are you listening? The spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, to the one who is what? I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The Bible proclaims that Jesus Christ is the way to reconnect your hearts with the eternity that God set there when you were born. And the only reason and the only way that you can reconnect your heart with the purpose that you were created for is to reconnect with Jesus Christ. This is what I want to do. I want to define eternity for you Today, I want to give you two definitions of eternity. The first one is what we mostly are familiar with, what eternity means. And eternity is this. It is the endless duration of time. You can write that down if you're taking notes. The endless duration of time, meaning eternity is forever and ever and ever. Eternity is the very beginning and the very end, or before the beginning and after the end. That, that eternity spans from, from as far as you can think of in the past and as far as you can think of in the future, that eternity is this endless duration of time. And the Bible declares that the God that we serve is an eternal God, which means this, which means that he was there at the beginning or before the beginning, and he will be there at the end or after the end. In fact, the Bible uses languages like this for God. He says that, that, that God is the ancient of days, that he was there ancient before the actual days existed. The, the New Testament describes God as the Alpha and Omega, 
That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. They say he is the beginning and the end. The sense that God is eternal and God is eternity is all over scripture. But here's the reality. The Bible also says that we were made in the image of God and this is where God placed inside each of us this wiring for eternity to, to have this sense that there is something more and there is something better. Eternity is the endless duration of time. But, but let me tell you, a lot of times when we think of eternity, we stop right there. We just said, oh, eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. But eternity is also this. This is the second one. Eternity is the fullness of life. Eternity is this idea that, 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 that not only it is something forever, but it's something that you can have now that is full. Jesus said this in John 6, 47. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me has eternal life. You see, eternal life is described as the one thing that God gives us to fulfill the deep need and desire in our heart. And if we put our trust and faith in Jesus, that's what it means to believe, then we receive this rich life, a full life, full of vitality and power and joy and peace and hope. That eternity is not only this span of time, but it also is the quality of time. Now, I, I told you this in the last series that we did, that my wife's love language is quality time. And how many of you know there's a difference between the quantity of time you spend with one another and how that time and the quality of that time. How many of you know what I'm talking about if you're married, right? And, and now we can spend four hours together watching TV, which we, we don't watch that much TV, but we could spend time together doing something else and it wouldn't be quality, or we could spend an hour and there'd be quality. And, and eternity has a sense that it's not only quantitative, but it's also qualitative. That it's not only forever and ever and ever. It's how, what kind of life that is forever and ever and ever. It's the quality of the life that goes on forever and ever and ever. And, and I want to, can we put that verse back on the screen? Whoever believes in me has eternal life. Did you notice this? The, the, the language, pay attention to the details in the Bible because the details are very specific. It says anyone who believes has eternal life. It doesn't say this, anyone who believes will have. Anyone who believes is going to have. Anyone who believes did have. He says anyone who believes has eternal life. It means this, that eternity is something that you can have right now. When we think of eternity, we've been trained to think and say that, that, that the day I die and breathe my last breath is the day I will enter eternity. Well, the Bible doesn't actually say that because we think eternity is the destination. Eternity isn't the destination. Heaven's the destination. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to talk about that next week. I'm going to talk about heaven. And if you really want to get theological, I'm going to talk about new heaven and new earth, which is life after life after death, okay? But I don't want to confuse you today. But eternity is not the destination. Eternity is, is, is this force of life, this power that God gives you now that spans through even your physical death. And it is eternity Eternity, write this down if you're taking notes. Eternity does not start on the day that you die. It starts on the day that you say yes to Jesus. That fullness of life, that vitality, that joy, that power, that hope can start while you're here on this earth. Eternity is different than heaven. Heaven is where you will spend eternity. But eternal life is the most profound promises in the Bible. In fact, you heard Blake say it earlier when we sang the song, that all the promises of God are yes and amen. But if you want to point out the most important promise of the Bible, it is this one. The promise that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have, not will have, but you have eternal life life. And at that moment, your heart is reconnected with eternity, the thing that it was destined for and purposed for that God has placed in your heart. And it is only through God where you will receive that eternal life, that vitality of life. Here is the reality is that the wait is over. Are we there yet? Yep. The wait is over. We are here. Now, here's the biggest question. 
The biggest question is this, well, how do I have eternity? How do I have eternity? We've also been trained to think that eternity is a prayer that we set. Now, prayer is an entrance into a life of, of faith in Jesus Christ, but don't get confused between a formula and actually having faith. Are you with me? And so how do we get eternity from God, eternal life, in the present, in the now, right here? Well, there's this verse that Jesus said. Jesus prays this prayer in John 17. And he prays this prayer to God, and he's about to die on the cross and ascend to heaven. And his heart is just kind of agonizing over the people that he's going to leave behind. And, and oftentimes we read scripture and we miss over the, the smallest details. But he says this. He says, now this is eternal life. This, listen, this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is this. It is the knowledge of God. And knowledge of God is more than intellect. It's more than, a, than an intellectual ascension to, to believing cognitively, cognitively in God. It is full trust, intimacy, knowledge of God. And the reality is this, is that you can have knowledge of God right here, right now. And you can have knowledge of God in heaven. You actually, you'll have the full knowledge of God when you enter heaven's reality. Eternal life is the knowledge of God. The greatest promise in the Bible is that you can have eternity and you have eternity through the knowledge of God. So let me end with here. I want to give you four quick points about eternal life. The four promises of eternal life for every single person in the room. The first one is this, is I can have eternity right now. You don't have to wait until you lay on your deathbed and then you'll say, you know what? That's the point where I'm gonna live differently. And I'm gonna live however I want right now because I know in the future I'm gonna make the decision to live for God. But the Bible says when you know that eternity is available to you, the, it, you, you receive it when you understand and you know. And you can have eternity right now as we speak. You can have the life that God has for you, the blessed life or abundant life, how, whatever kind of life that you want to describe the Bible as giving you, that you have it right now. And the desire in your heart of for, uh, for eternity can be activated by the power of God. And the second one is this, is that I receive eternity when I trust in Jesus. Jesus said this, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Listen to the language. I want you to catch this. And will not be judged, but will cross over from death to life. What Jesus is saying is that the moment that you believe and put your trust and faith in Jesus is the moment you cross over from death to life. A lot of us have been trained to think that, that the moment I cross over from death to life is the moment that I die and then I'm going to go to heaven. But he is saying this, the moment that you receive Jesus and the moment you put your trust in him is the moment that, that, that your old self has died and you have a new life. Paul puts it this way, that when we are in Christ, we are a what? A new creation. We have been made new. And I receive eternity when I trust in Jesus. The third one is this, is I don't live in anticipation for eternity. I live from a place of eternity. You see, our life in Christ now flows from eternal life that he has already given us. And in the daily aspects of your life, you get to live in the knowledge of God. Now, I told you I'm going to descend in the plane in a couple of weeks. I'm going to talk about uh, discipleship. And discipleship is this. It is a slow transformation of your life on this earth to be more like Jesus. And if you want to know what it means to live out eternity in, uh, in your life while you live on this earth, you've got to understand discipleship and transformation of Jesus. Because that is where we experience the fullness of what God has for us on this life. And it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that you're not going to experience heartache and you're not going to experience pain and you're not going to experience suffering. We still live in a world 
where, where, where there is sin and brokenness in the world. And so you'll still experience those things, but it means that those things won't drag you down as they would for those who don't know Jesus. And I don't live in anticipation for eternity. I live from a place of eternity. And let me give you this fourth one, and then I wanna pray. That eternity on earth prepares me for eternity in heaven. Make no mistake about it, friends, that, that your life on this earth influences your life in the future in heaven. What you do here on earth impacts your life in heaven. God says this, God, God says that he is a rewarder of those who do good. He says for, for those who are victorious, there's the tree of life and there is a victorious crown waiting for those of those who have been changed by Jesus, invited them into their life. There is treasure waiting. In fact, Jesus said this to people who are struggling with the material possessions. He says, do not store up treasure on earth where moths and rust destroy, but I want you to store up treasure in heaven. Why would you ever store up treasure in heaven? Because when you get there, it'll be waiting for you. And I want to unpack those things during this series, but you've got to understand how you live your life on this earth impacts your life forever in heaven. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, life is short? So let's just live it up now. You've been lied to. Life isn't short. Life is really, really, really long. Life is forever. But you decide what your forever actually is. You decide what the life actually is. Life on earth matters, not because it's the only life we have, but precisely because it isn't. And the Bible constantly talks about living and believing and acting and trusting in such a way that prepares you for your eternal life in heaven. I wanna close in a prayer this morning. I want everyone in the room to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I wanna give you an invitation. I wanna start this series off right by giving you an invitation because I believe that there are some people here that walked into this room and you feel empty in your life. You, you feel like there is something missing, a sadness or discontentment. And you've been looking in all the wrong places. You've been looking in relationships. You've been looking in your career. Maybe you're thinking, if I go to school, I'll fill it. If I, if I switch jobs, if I, if I move to another location, because your heart is searching, your life is searching what your heart desires for eternity. Maybe some of you walked in this room and you feel restless in your soul. You just don't feel settled. You don't feel right. Let me tell you what you're looking for. You're looking for eternity. And I believe there are people here that maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And I wanna give you that invitation today. But I also believe that there are some of you here that maybe when you were younger, you made the decision, but you haven't been walking that way and you haven't been living that way and you haven't been believing that way. And you feel far from God. And that far from God creates a separation. It creates a void in our lives. And that separation must be reconciled for the eternity to fill your heart again. And so I wanna give you an invitation this morning to put your trust and faith back in Jesus Christ. And this is what I wanna do. I wanna say a prayer. And I want all of us in the room to say this prayer together. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And I wanna ask you who are here today, if today is a day that you wanna reconnect with your Father and reconnect with the creator of the cosmos. Maybe you've been separate for some time. Maybe you've never prayed this prayer, but if you want that reconnection with God, I want you to mean this prayer deep down in your heart. This prayer is between you and God. Everyone in the room, repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. 
Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my mistakes. I believe he rose from the grave. Forgive me of my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. Give me your spirit to fill me, to guide me, to restore me, to return to me what the enemy has taken. Take my fear and turn it into faith. Take my pain and use it for your purpose. I surrender my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you one more question. I want to ask you in a moment to lift your hand if you made that prayer, if that prayer became real to you, that you came back to God in that moment. I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to point you out. I just want to agree with you today that this is the day that you've made that decision. And so if you're here today and you said, you know what, that prayer became real to me, would you, wherever you're at, would you just lift up your hand right now? Amen, I see your hand, 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 lots of hands, I see your hand, I see your hand in the back. Anyone else? If you lifted your hand with everyone else, your heads bowed and eyes closed, just look up at me for a moment. I just wanna tell you that you've made the most important decision that you've ever made in your life, to reconnect with the creator of the cosmos. And in that moment, and in that place, that the spirit of the living God comes down and dwells deep down within your heart and within your soul. And you get to reconnect with the eternal God who put eternity within your heart. And your life will never be different. It, it will never be the same. It will be different. It'll be changed. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. God, as we study your scriptures and what it says about eternity and the future and the reality of heaven and how we live on this earth, God, would you illuminate it in our hearts and our souls? Would you stir something up in our church? Would you stir something up in our community? God, we give you praise today and we give you honor. We love you and we praise you. And everyone said, amen. Church, can we just celebrate those who made a decision this morning? Come on. Thank you, God. We give you praise, Lord. We give you praise, God. We love you, Jesus. God bless you, church. I'll see you next week. Have a great Sunday.